well, this is this is much easier than uh, getting a visa. So <laughs> <laughs> that we we would um, appreciate it more, of course. Me too. Yes. <laughs> Are you are you finding that uh, <clears throat> organizing things in this time is is, uh, is sort of easier because you can much easier, you know, yeah. Because people people are stuck in their homes and uh, yeah, <clears throat> yeah. And well, I mean, either you can do it or you can't. You don't have to worry about uh, rearranging everything. And, yes, know, yeah. Actually, or... that's that's much easier in that <clears throat> in this period, of course. So uh, let me please introduce you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back. Uh, let's go for the next talk. Uh, William Bialek is the John Archibald Wheeler Professor in Physics at the Princeton University. He is a visiting presidential professor of physics at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. Uh, where he is helping uh, to launch an initiative uh, for the theoretical sciences. Uh, born in 1960 and educated in the San Francisco public schools, uh, Bialek graduated from Lowell High School in 1977. He attended the University of California at Berkeley, receiving his AB and his PhD in biophysics. He joined the faculty of Berkeley in 1986 in late 1990, he moved to the newly formed uh, NEC Research Institute in Princeton, uh, where he, he eventually became an uh, institute fellow. He joined the Princeton faculty as professor of physics in 2001. Um, uh, throughout his career, Bialek has been involved both in helping to establish biophysics as a subdiscipline within physics and helping uh, biology to absorb the quantitative intellectual tradition of the physical sciences. During his years at NEC, he organized the Princeton Lectures on Biophysics, a serious workshop that provided many young phys physicists with an introduction to the challenges and opportunities at uh, the interface with biology. So for more than 20 years, Professor Bialik has participated in summer courses at Marine Biological Lab Laboratory in Woods Hole, Massachusetts, uh, serving as a co-director for com of the computational neuroscience course in the summer of 1998 through 2002. Uh, currently, he is involved in a major educational experiment at Princeton to create a truly integrated and mathematically uh, sophisticated introduction to the natural sciences for first year college students. Uh, so please join me to welcome uh, Professor William Bialek. William, where are you? Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> so you hear me and uh, and you see the slides? Uh, you can check the comments too for the feedback. Ah, very good. Okay. So thank, you, thank you. <clears throat> okay. So <clears throat> what I'd like to do today is to talk about um, approaches that are grounded in theoretical physics for thinking about large networks of neurons. <clears throat> but I'll be interested more in how we take these ideas from the realm of uh, purely theoretical models and carry them over to look at real data. As many of you know, there's a, there's a long tradition of neural network models that reaches back uh, I suspect before most of you were born. Um, and uh, this has had, the, it's, it's a very sophisticated subject and uh, there are many beautiful theoretical questions, um, but these the models that people thought about were often a little bit difficult to connect to the kinds of experiments people were doing. Um, things have changed dramatically in the last decade or so um, and that, I think, uh, makes this a, a very exciting time for us and, and also changes the kind of science that we want to do. So let me um, jump in by giving you a feeling for how things have changed. Um, so this is an example of a, a reasonably contemporary experiment done by my colleague David Tank and his group at Princeton. Um, 
This is an experiment in which you genetically engineer a mouse so that all of the cells in the brain express a protein, which is fluorescent, uh, but the fluorescence is sensitive to the calcium concentration inside the cell. And as you all know, the calcium concentration in a neuron follows the electrical activity of the neuron, uh, albeit a little bit slowly. So what you get here is uh, you've converted the electrical activity of the neuron into a fluorescent signal that you can observe under a microscope. <clears throat> you've smoothed it out a little bit in time. Um, but the trade for that is that uh, because the signal is now an optical signal, you can look across a large field of view and see many individual neurons at the same time. So I want to emphasize that to make these experiments work, um, you have to get many things right. <clears throat> I'm a theorist, so I can talk about my experimentalist friends and tell you uh, how remarkable this is without, uh, without bragging. Um, so the idea is you have, to, uh, you have to genetically engineer the mouse, and there's a certain amount that this is getting to be standard, but um, still requires uh, some care with the molecular biology. Remember that neurons are very small and they're very densely packed, so you need a very high-resolution microscope. In this case, um, uh, and by the way, uh, the brain, of course, is a, I mean, you've all seen brains, they're white, um, which tells you that the light doesn't pass through them. It gets scattered, like in milk. And so uh, in order to see through uh, in depth, uh, one of the techniques that people have used is two-photon microscopy, where you excite the fluorescent molecules um, not on resonance, but with, uh, with light that has half the photon energy. So it's a two-photon transition. And then the molecule, once excited, fluoresces. Um, this also has the advantage that the, um, the wavelength of the, of the light that you use for excitation and the light that is emitted are a factor of two apart. So they're very easy to distinguish. You don't get confused by the scattering. And in a two-photon microscope, this is done in a scanning mode where you have the focal spot on a particular neuron. And then even if the emitted light is scattered, it doesn't matter because you know that it all came from that particular spot. And then you scan the spot and reconstruct the image. So what you see here is um, the, a schematic of the microscope. There's the microscope looking down. Um, there's a, a very fancy laser sitting over here that produces powerful enough pulses that you can do to photon excitation. Um, there's a lot of optics that you're not seeing uh, in the schematic, and it's all aimed at the head of this little mouse, which has, as I mentioned, been genetically engineered. Now, ah, I asked whether it's possible to enlarge the slides. Uh, probably. Let's see. Um, what happens if I do that? Uh, that's not quite what you want, maybe. Um, Sorry for interrupts. Uh, you can click on the button uh, right, uh, I'm sorry, up left of the slides window, and then you can uh, find the enlarge button. Sorry, sorry. where should I be looking? Uh, the button on up left of the slides button, uh, if it's not enlarged yet. Uh, layout, slideshow. Um, I think the problem is, hmm. Uh, we had this discussion, I think, when I we think tested this is out. Okay. Yeah, I think uh, this is okay. Mine is okay, actually. Ah, I see. So uh, I guess individually you can enlarge the slides in your, in your own view of it. <clears throat> okay, uh, maybe I'll go on. Um, so, uh, so the idea is you're observing uh, the, the fluorescence of these individual neurons. Um, there's a problem, which is that uh, many of the neurons in the brain don't do anything very interesting unless the animal is able to move around and do things. Um, but of course, uh, observing things uh, through a microscope with uh, resolution near the wavelength of light while the animal's moving around is pretty difficult. So the, the trick that's used here is to hold the head of the mouse fixed so that you can uh, look into the brain, but the rest of him is, fle is free to run around. And he's running on a styrofoam ball, 
and that ball is suspended with a column of air so that at, if he runs, the ball rotates underneath him. And then there's um, the mouse, a different kind of mouse from the computer, um, which is used to monitor the movement of the ball. And then that signal, you can reconstruct where the mouse would have been moving in space if he had been running with that particular trajectory. And then you can use that to drive a computer system, which creates a kind of virtual reality for the mouse. So in this particular case, the mouse is um, running through some virtual environment um, while you're observing what's going on in the brain. So you have to get the physics of the microscope right. You have to get the computer science and engineering of the virtual reality right. And you have to get the molecular biology of genetically engineering the mouse right, um, which, is, which is quite a trick. Um, the kinds of signals that come out are really gorgeous. Um, this is uh, where you're focusing on a single neuron. <clears throat> And um, you can see that, the, that there are long periods where the neuron is essentially silent, and then you see brief bursts of activity. And you can either think of these bursts of activity as being on and off, um, as uh, discretized here, or you could use the continuous value of the fluorescence signal, which presumably reflects how many action potentials are hiding underneath this burst. I should say all of these technologies are, are evolving very rapidly. Um, I will tell you about experiments um, using calcium sensors uh, where uh, the, my colleagues are recording up to uh, 1,500 neurons simultaneously. There are different ways of trading sensitivity and time resolution and area uh, that you detect so that some people are recording from tens of thousands of neurons or even 100,000 neurons, although perhaps not with single cell resolution. There are uh, proteins being engineered which insert into the membrane and directly sense to convert the voltage across the membrane into a fluorescent signal, um, which should be faster and should allow you to see individual action potentials without any difficulty. So this is uh, sort of a snapshot of a very rapidly evolving field. But what's important is that suddenly, um, instead of be being forced to look at neurons one neuron at a time, and you know, as both neuroscientists and physicists have the intuition that what's going on in the brain is somehow much more collective. You have large numbers of neurons interacting with each other, but seeing that collective activity is very difficult if you can only look at one neuron at a time. Now you can look at 100 neurons at a time, 1,000 neurons at a time, and more. And so we would like to have a, a way of approaching these data that connects with our theoretical ideas. And that's the subject for today. So let me <clears throat> start by asking, what would it mean to understand when you're faced with experiments like this? And obviously, there are many possible answers. So let me start with a simple picture in which if I look in a small window of time, neurons are either active or they're silent. That might be because you have enough time resolution that you can see individual action potentials, and then the discretization is, is clear. Um, it comes from the neurons. It might be that, as with the calcium signals, you're a little bit more coarse-grained in time. And so you're going to uh, just threshold and say, uh, I trust that this is when the neuron is on and this is when the neuron is off. Um, this is just to, to fix ideas. Um, so then the states of individual neurons are binary, right? They're zero and one for silent and active. And then the state of the entire network is a collection of N of these binary variables, which you can think of as being an N-bit word. And so to uh, emphasize something which I think is uh, probably clear to all of you, but it's good to keep it in mind, um, because there are many combinations of spike of activity and silence in N neurons, there are many N bit words, and this number grows to be um, uh, to be very large, very fast. So if you have ten neurons, the number is a thousand possible states. If, on the other hand, you have twenty neurons, it's a million possible states, and well, it keeps going. Uh, my personal favorite is that if you get to a population of 265 neurons, then the number of possible states is uh, comparable to the number of baryons in the universe. Um, and so these are literally numbers which are beyond astronomical. Um, at least in American English, when we say that something's very large, we say that the number is astronomical. Here, uh, it's beyond that, right? It's very easy to get to numbers which are larger than what our astrophysics friends have to think about. And so what you can't do is to go and wait for the network to take on every single one of these states and figure out what's going on. So there's lots of questions you might ask. 
in an attempt to reach uh, something like understanding. So one is, what do these states mean for the organism? Uh, when I see particular combinations of activity and silence, what, what does that mean to the organism? You sort of suspect that not every detail of, of that is important. So maybe uh, if neuron 10 is active and neuron 11 is silent, but they switch places, uh, maybe that doesn't matter. Um, so really, the organism is only keeping track of, of something that is a bit more averaged over uh, the different cells in some complicated way. Um, you might also be interested in dynamics. How does the network get from, in time from one state to the next? Um, if there are particular states or combinations of states or groups of states that are very prominent in the activity, how do these get stored in the network? Um, and these are all great questions, which I'm not going to answer today. I'm not even going to try to answer. And the reason is that in some way, these questions are like building a dictionary. So when I tell you what the, if you think of the activity patterns in the network as being like words, then asking what they mean is literally building a dictionary. Asking how you get from one, what the rules are for how you get from one to the next is a little bit like building a grammar. But you know that before you build a dictionary or grammar, you need a lexicon. You need to tell me what words are possible and how often do I use them? And so what I would like to do as a way of a stepping stone toward understanding is to ask what is the probability distribution with which these different states of the network are accessed by the brain? And so that's gonna be the goal. Well, how do I do that? Well, traditionally, if you're a theorist, you do this by trying to build a dynamical model of the system. And you know, there's a classic version of this that goes back to Hopfield in the early 1980s. Um, and uh, the, um, the idea of this model is that um, each neuron sums up its input from all the other neurons, and there are weights associated to these inputs. And if it's above a threshold, then at the next moment in time, that neuron will turn on. On the other hand, if the activity is below threshold, the neuron will turn off. And the insight that Hopfield had, this model actually goes back to the 1940s. And it's known that by choosing different uh, combinations of these synaptic strengths or synaptic weights that connect one neuron to another, you can generate arbitrarily complicated dynamics. Um, but what Hopfield realized was that if you make the approximation, which is surely wrong, but helps you to get insight, that uh, the, um, that the matrix W uh, that describes these connections is symmetric, then this dynamics is equivalent to always going downhill or lowering a quantity, which if you're a mathematician, you can think of, uh, you can think of as a Lyapunov function, but maybe as a physicist, it's more natural to think of it as being an energy. So you're sort of rolling downhill in an energy function that has a very simple form. And that means that the dynamics can only stop when you get to a, a local minimum of this energy function. And you can think of those local minima as being like stored memories or the solutions to particular computational problems. And if you watch the network over time, the probability distribution should spend most of its time in those stable stationary states um, that are at the end of the dynamics that things get reset by the environment and so on. Um, and if you take this model and instead of imagining that after it stops, you reset it by hand because you know, you're looking at a new picture or smell a new smell or something like that. Um, imagine there's just a little bit of noise in the system, then depending on the details, but uh, it, you know exactly what happens depends on the details. But from many simple ways of adding the noise, what you'll end up with is that this energy, which was a dynamical quantity, becomes an energy in the sense of statistical mechanics and the probability distribution becomes something that's at least close to the Boltzmann distribution. Um, and hence, if the noise is not too large, so beta, the inverse of an effective temperature, is very large, then the probability distribution would be dominated by the minima of this energy. So that's a model. But the problem is that, that you know, uh, this is, it's a model, right? And I, I, sort of at every step in building this model, I've said something which isn't true. It's not true that things just add up linearly. It's not true that it's a simple matter of taking a threshold. It's not true that connections are symmetric and so on. And it's very hard to figure out um, in what way all of those simplifications um, affect the answer. So there's another approach, um, which is, uh, let me see if I can find my way back to 
Um, somehow I've lost the part where, ah, there it is. Um, good. So the, an alternative is to, um, is to try and start with things that you measure, especially today when we can measure so much. So you can certainly measure the mean activity of individual neurons. Because you're able to monitor many neurons at the same time, you can measure, for example, correlations between pairs of neurons. But remember that if you have 100 neurons, there's 100 values of the mean activity, and there's 5,000 values of the correlations. There's 5,000 different pairs. So saying that you can measure the correlations between pairs is, is saying um, that you can uh, measure a lot more numbers. So you should worry a little bit about whether you have enough data. Um, and you can imagine continuing down this path of, of measuring the correlations between groups of three neurons, but now there's 100,000 of them. And so you should be a little careful not to go too far down this path because eventually you'll run out of data. So if I tell you that you can measure these quantities, then you could ask, well, let me build a probability distribution that's consistent with those measurements. The problem is there's infinitely many of these. So which one do you pick? And the answer is you want to, in this context, I think that a sensible thing to do is to ask for the, the probability distribution that has as little structure as possible, but is consistent with what has been measured experimentally at, in these average activity and average correlations. And the reason for that is that, that you want to ask, what do I, if I want to describe the probability distribution over all the states, and remember, there's this enormous number of them, I want to build a model that has only the structure that the data force me to include. Right? I don't want to add anything of my prejudices um, because perhaps uh, I'll be wrong. So um, the question is, how do you implement this notion of as little structure as possible? And um, Shannon taught us that the only way of measuring structure or randomness and so on is to compute the entropy of the probability distribution. If you choose anything else, you'll, you'll get into paradoxes. And so what we want to do is to find the probability distribution that maximizes the entropy while still being consistent with these measurements. And so the way to do that is to solve a, a, a sort of calculus of variations problem, which is you maximize the entropy, and then you introduce Lagrange multipliers to constrain the mean activity that you would compute in the probability distribution to be equal to what you observe experimentally. And similarly, the correlation between pairs of neurons should, it, computed in the probability distribution should be equal to what you see experimentally. And you need one Lagrange multiplier for each neuron to constrain the mean activity and another Lagrange multiplier for each pair in order to constrain the correlations. So this looks like a complicated problem, but uh, at least formally it's not. And many of you know the answer because one way of saying what it means to be a thermal equilibrium is that you're at maximum entropy at a fixed average energy. And that, into, and that generates the Boltzmann distribution. And so what you get in this problem is something that looks very much like the Boltzmann distribution. And there's an energy that sits in the exponential. And remarkably, that energy is exactly the form of the Hopfield model, except that the things that you used to think of as being in the dynamical model synaptic connections are, um, in fact, just the Lagrange multipliers. And similarly, the things that were the thresholds are now, again, Lagrange multipliers. So the good news is that you get back to a model that we understand and have thought about for a long time. The bad news is that the parameters don't have the sort of microscopic dynamical meaning that they used to have. Um, and that's OK, because we're in physics, we're used to the idea, as we'll talk about a little more um, later on, that models often have parameters that don't have a direct microscopic interpretation. And an important thing about this is that once you have that once you have used the mean activity of the neurons to determine the parameters h i, and once you've used the correlations between pairs of neurons to determine the parameters j i j, by the way, this is in general a hard numerical problem, but I'm not going to talk about that here. Then anything else that you compute is um, a, a prediction with no free parameters. Now there are various things you should worry about in doing all this of which the deepest question is, why should this work? And so rather than addressing the why should it work question now, let me put that off um, until we see whether it does work. And in fact, we'll have to say what we mean by work. So 
<clears throat> I think that the next slide is blank. And the reason for that was to pause here and give you a chance to ask questions. Um, so let me take a few minutes for that, um, if there are things that, that are not clear yet, because we're about to launch into looking at, at real data. You needn't be shy. I'm not shy. Do you hear me well? Yes. OK. Thank you for the talk, and thank you. Well, we have, there's a bit more. Uh, this is just a pause. Uh, Aha, I see. People will raise their, ah, uh, people will raise their hand. Good. Um, Aha, uh -huh. please. Do you hear me? I hear you, yes. OK. What's the cost of detailed balanced assumption? Because you assume that WIJ is equal to WJI. Without <clears throat> that, the notion of thermal equilibrium and all ideas from physics are still correct, but a bit risky. But in the brain, so, why should WIJ and WJI go as detailed balance for us? Okay, stars? so this is uh, question one, or things the thing item one of things you should worry about um, <clears throat> so in the dynamical model you're making an explicit assumption that wij is equal to wji and that is equivalent to a kind of detailed balance assumption you're correct and that's wrong uh, real real neural networks don't have that property and so yeah. you have to ask which things will still be true as you move away from that. What's interesting <clears throat> in the maximum entropy construction is that we didn't make any dynamical assumptions. There is no assumption of detailed balance. What we're describing is the probability distribution at one moment in time, right? So I only think about the distribution over states that I see at one moment. I'm not saying anything about the dynamics. <clears throat> And in fact, there are infinitely many dynamical models that can generate the same stationary probability distribution. And some of those models have detailed balance and some of them don't. So in fact, although the description that we arrive at looks like a thermal equilibrium description, you should beware of the metaphor because there is no uh, dynamical uh, correspondence for this, right? So when you see, I mean, another way of saying it is the following. If I show you a probability distribution and it looks like e to the minus something, it's very tempting to say that the thing that's sitting up in the exponential is an energy function yes. and the dynamics of the system is like Brownian motion on that potential surface. But that doesn't have to be true, right? For example, if I have a distribution which is Gaussian, you could say that the way it gets to be Gaussian is that what you're observing is the Brownian motion of a mass hanging from a spring. And the fluctuations will be Gaussian and the dynamics will obey detailed balance. But you know that there's ways for, if I take, for example, n independent stochastic processes, each of which does not obey detailed balance, and I average them together, then if I look at a single moment in time by the central limit theorem at large n, I'll always get a Gaussian, but there's no detailed balance, right? So this is, if you want to take this whole framework and extend it to think about dynamics in time, you can. And actually there's been beautiful work by, by some of my colleagues. Um, I haven't been, in, been involved in this, uh, both in thinking about populations of neurons uh, and in thinking about uh, flocks of birds, actually. Um, so there, uh, the, the, the generalization is that instead of trying to build maximum entropy models that match the correlations at one moment in time, you also try to match the correlations um, at successive moments in time. And then you lose the symmetry, right? So at a single moment in time, uh, the correlation between neuron 10 and neuron 20 is the same as the correlation between neuron 20 and neuron 10, because correlations are between pairs. But if I allow for an offset in time, then 10 before 20 is different than 20 before 10, and you can get an asymmetry. Mm -hmm. Okay, I guess I got some point of 
points of the, your answer. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> okay, maybe I will go on. So let's see. <clears throat> let's see how this works when we look at real data. And my colleagues and I have been involved in two very different efforts. Uh, one, which was where we started, was in the retina. Uh, and we got up to, uh, we started with what, you know, the large number of neurons that we started with was 10, but that was uh, 15 years ago. And eventually we got up to uh, 160 when we learned lots of things along the way. Um, and many of the young people who were involved in this are now uh, uh, professors in their own right. So it, uh, uh, they did uh, really spectacular things. Um, what I want to talk about is more recent work, um, which is in the mouse hippocampus um, uh, in collaboration with uh, the laboratories of David Tank and Carlos Brody. Uh, the experimentalist who was doing most of the work was Jeff Gauthier, who's now at the faculty at, at Swarthmore. And all of the theoretical work was done by a marvelous graduate student, Lenoy Mishulam, who's now um, a postdoctoral fellow at MIT. And um, there's a set of references, actually a set of references on both sides, um, which you're welcome to look at. I think it's the case that you'll you'll keep the slides, right? So um, if people want to uh, look at the references, they can. And and you'll also notice that everything has an archive uh, number. So um, you can trace our progress such as it is by looking at the archive. So <clears throat> you saw what the data looked like. You have these beautiful fluorescent signals where the cells turn on and off. And if you measure the probability that the neuron is on as a function of the position of the mouse along the virtual track that it's running on, remember it's running on this ball, but you use virtual reality to simulate uh, an environment. And in this case, the environment is very simple. The mouse runs along a track, he gets a reward at the end, then he comes back to the beginning. There's a population of cells that are the famous place cells in the hippocampus. Um, which means that they are active when the animal is in a particular position along the track, and you can put them in order. So you should imagine that as the animal runs along the track, the neurons turn on and off in sequence. Um, but that's only half the cells. The other half of the cells are doing something else. And this is known that, that uh, whenever you are in a particular environment, only a fraction of the cells in the hippocampus or in a particular region of the hippocampus, in this case it's CA1, um, are actually uh, functioning as place cells, and the other ones are doing something else. They might be place cells in another environment, or they might just be doing something else. Um, we don't know. Uh, there are uh, lots of ideas. Um, so let's take the data. I mean, you don't take the data in this form. You take the data in its raw form. It's about an hour long, so you have um, thousands and thousands and thousands of moments in time where you see the activity of, in this case, uh, roughly 100 neurons simultaneously. And then um, we're going to build a model of this, which is um, this uh, probability distribution, which again came from the principle of maximum entropy. And uh, the trick then is that you have to find the numerical values of the HI and the JIJ that match the average activity of the neurons, which is what we show here, and their correlations, which is what you see in this matrix, or the just collapse, you see the distribution of correlations over here. Um, let me highlight two features of the data. One is that neurons are active only a very small fraction of the time. You'll notice that this is just a few percent. That is typical, um, not unusual at all. And most of the correlations are negative. And at least for place cells, you understand why this is true. If I have two neurons that are, that are, um, that are uh, supposed to be active in different places, then they can never be active at the same time. And so their activity um, will be anti-correlated if you're not watching where the mouse is. And that's what you see. And so correspondingly, since um, right, sigma equals plus one is active and zero is inactive, then to favor being silent, H should be negative, and it is. And um, to favor anti-correlation between pairs, most of the Js should be negative, and they are although um, there is a tail of positive correlations, of positive interactions. Notice, by the way, that the typical scale of the correlations is quite small, so 10% correlations would be a big thing. So the neurons are correlated with one another, but not very strongly. And yet, we'll see that there are interesting collective behaviors that are predicted by this model. 
So you can go through the exercise of constructing this model, and it's motivated by this idea of looking for the simplest possible model that's consistent with these exper the experimental observations on this side. And you can do that, but, but does it work? So in order to see whether it works, you have to calculate something about the behavior of the network that is not what you used in building the model. So since we use the pairs of neurons in building the model, let's think about what happens if we look at three neurons simultaneously. So you can ask about a triplet correlation, which essentially is what's the probability that all three neurons are active at the same time, minus what you would have expected if they were independent of each other, just by coincidence. And what you see is that the predicted values and the observed values line up very well. Um, but it's a little hard to read this plot because there's 100,000 points on it. And most of them are in here in this dense part where you can't see anything. So in order to take this apart, what we did was we said, let's take a little window along the axis, the x-axis here, which is what we predict. And inside that window, let's compute two things. One is, what is the typical size of the error bar in our measurements? And the other is, how far are we away? How, how big is the discrepancy between the prediction and the observation? Okay. So one of these is uh, errors in our measurement, and the other is errors in the prediction of the model. And what you see is that if you look inside this core, um, these two things agree with each other perfectly. Um, which means that we've built a model that makes predictions which are as good as our experimental measurements. And of course, they can't be better than the experimental measurements um, because if they were, that would mean that you were somehow overfitting the data. Um, so you really can't build a model that makes better predictions than this. And this is all the detailed structure of the triplet correlations in the network. And so you might say, well, wait a second, this is the hippocampus. Uh, Generations of neuroscientists have explained to us how the hippocampus works. It is a place where you make maps of space. So we know that cells have place fields. And because there are place fields, they, the cells inherit some correlation structure. Remember, I gave you the argument that because there are place fields, you expect most correlations to be negative. So suppose you tried to take the picture where cells respond based on the position of the mouse. and um, they do so independently of each other, and you match the place fields, you will predict that there are triplet correlations. And in fact, you'll predict that there's some range of them. But unfortunately, the triplet correlations that you predict are almost uncorrelated with the triplet correlations that you observe. So that means that if you had tried to match only the place fields, then there are, there are networks that would generate the same place fields but not get any of these triplet correlations right at all, whereas we get all 100,000 of them right within, within error bars, which really is, for me, um, quite a surprising uh, match of these rather simple physics-based models to the details of a rather complicated biological system. So let's try one other way of seeing whether things work. Remember that I have a model for the probability distribution over all of the neurons. So that means that I can think about the conditional probability distribution. Suppose that I take one neuron and I watch that one neuron and I tell you what all the other neurons are doing. If I tell you what all the other neurons are doing, I can predict the probability that the last neuron will be active or silent. And um, the sort of physics analogy for this is that effectively, right, the variables are binary. So they're like spins. So effectively, what's happening is that the rest of the network is applying a, a magnetic field, an effective field to the, um, to the one neuron that you're watching. And you can compute what that field is because it's built out of the activity of the individual neurons and the coupling constants J and, and the parameters H. So what you can then do is to walk through the data for one neuron and compute at each moment what is the effective field. You can then group together all the times you observed an effective field of minus two and ask in all of those moments in time across all the neurons, what was the probability that the neuron is actually active? And the answer is it's about 10%. And that is what the theory predicts with no free parameters. But this, and this is really pretty good, but, but you realize this is an average over neurons and it's an average over time. So in order to understand what's going on, we should unpack this 
and look moment by moment in time. And then what you see is here um, that the most of the time, it is predicted that any individual neuron should have a very low probability of being active. And only occasionally does that probability rise above, uh, above zero, significantly above zero. And it is only at those moments where you see that the neuron is actually active. And of course, it's not every time because it is a probability, right? You'll notice the probability never reaches one. So, but um, these are several, I mean, these are many moments in time hidden underneath here. So you have a pretty good shot at seeing any one neuron be active. You might worry that this is again, just because they're place cells and that there's some way in which information about place is being shared in the network and that's what makes it all work. So you go to one of the other half of the neurons which are not play cells and you see that it also works. In fact, the kind of spikiness of the, um, of the probability is even stronger and you still get a nearly perfect alignment of the moments in time um, with the predicted points of high probability. I will point out to you that even this one, which looks like it might be a miss, actually is not. The prediction is that there is um, a peak in probability, which just happens not to be very high. So presumably, if this happened again, the cell would not be active. And you know that that must be right, because if you look at the points where we predict a probability of about 10% to be active, indeed, only about 10% of the time are the neurons active. So this simple physics-based model is giving us a picture of what's happening collectively in the network, which is incredibly precise. In fact, even if you look at the place cells, it's been known for many years that when the mouse runs through a place field, sometimes place fields are missed. That is to say, a, a place cell does not activate when the animal passes through its place field. And if you look in detail at these, at these kinds of things, you see that um, we can actually predict that, right? because we're making predictions of the probability that individual neurons are active. Um, and you find that essentially the moments, the times when a single neuron misses its place field, that's because all the other neurons, at least in the model, it's because all the other neurons were in a state that disfavored that neuron being active. And in fact, the model makes absolutely no reference to place. It's only about what neurons are doing in relation to one another. So um, I think this is evidence that these very simple physics-based models capture an enormous amount of quantitative detail about what neurons are doing in a real network on the scale of about 100 neurons, even deep inside the mammalian brain. So now we want to shift gears a little bit. Um, let me see if I can, let me run ahead a little, and that'll leave a, a little more time at the end for questions rather than having a long pause here, unless there's something really urgent. Okay, let me, let me move ahead because the question you should really be asking yourself and that, that we've asked ourselves a lot in, in thinking about this is why should simple models like this work? So if I understand correctly, the audience here is mostly people who come from math and physics who are interested in problems in the neural and cognitive sciences. And you know that, that part of the problem in the, the balance between um, physics and biology is, or math and, and biology, is that on the math and physics side, we're greatly enamored of simple models. And on the biology side, there's a great appreciation for how complex everything is. And it's a question of how to match these together. In physics, we often use simple models to describe real systems. And it's important to realize that, that this works for a very deep reason. So let me, at which, by the way, we did not understand, um, let's say, in the generation before my student years. So my professors grew up in an environment where they didn't really know why this all worked. And it was only um, around the time that I was beginning my university studies that it all got clear. Um, so it was just a set scale, right? So this is something that happened in the 1970s. Um, so let me remind you that if you want to describe a magnet like the one that's sticking to your refrigerator, um, then uh, you describe it using the Ising model. And um, right, the individual atoms uh, are, have spins attached to them, right? The electrons uh, have spin. And although that's fundamentally quantum mechanical, you make a kind of classical picture where the spins can be 
discreetly up or down. And uh, so you think of them as being plus one or minus one uh, for up and down. The probability distribution over all the states of the system if the system's in thermal equilibrium is given by the Boltzmann distribution. And the energy has two terms. One is that there's a magnetic field that acts on every spin, which could be different in different places because of local variations. But then the spins interact with each other. Um, and so, for example, it might be that there's a tendency for two spins, which are right next to each other, to point in the same direction. So this configuration has lower energy than this configuration. And that's captured by a term that looks like this, um, where typically one assumes that the interactions are only between nearest neighbors on some sort of lattice. And of course, the model that we've written down here should be familiar by now. This is the model that, that came out of the discussion by Hopfield, and it's also the model that came out of our construction by maximum entropy matching the pairwise correlations. The thing I want to emphasize is that often when we talk about this, right, the history is that people wrote down these simple models. I mean, uh, Mr. Ezing here uh, was in the 1920s, so it's 100 years ago. Um, they wrote down these models, um, and they didn't really know what was going on microscopically inside the magnet, and they kind of crossed their fingers and hoped that simple models would work or at least teach us something about what was going on. There's a tendency to think that the reason it works is because these materials are simple in some microscopic sense, so that this is a good approximation to the microscopic physics. That's not true. There is no real magnet that is this simple. And we only fully understood why this works with the advent of the renormalization group. And in the normalization group, what you do in order to understand the model that you're studying is you ask what happens as you change scale. So for example, if instead of looking at the individual atoms, you average all the spins in some neighborhood and then take a majority rule. So you, you say, I don't care what every single spin is doing. What I want to know is if I draw a little circle that contains, I don't know, 10 spins, on average, or sorry, on average, are more of them up or down? And if more of them are up, then you say, well, there's one big spin, which is spin up. And if more of them are down, you say, there's one big spin, which is spin down. And now you ask, suppose I try to write down the probability distribution for these big spins, which represent little groups of spins. Well, again, you can write it in terms of a Boltzmann distribution. But now there's a new energy, which is a function of these uh, of these big spin variables or coarse grain variables. And at least to start, you might guess that it has the same form as the model you started with. But in general, except the parameters will change. And in fact, you'll have more complicated interactions. In fact, if you start on a regular lattice in two dimensions or three dimensions, and you start only with spins interacting with their neighbors, you'll generate, when you do this averaging over neighborhoods, you will generate terms where spins interact with their next nearest neighbor and so on. You'll generate terms where spins interact three at a time or four at a time or even more. There's all sorts of complicated things that will happen. And if this was the only thing that happened, then you'd say, well, I don't know. I, I mean, I can't learn anything by doing this. But it turns out that if you keep doing this and you keep going out to longer and longer scales, right? you, you average over a small neighborhood to generate new spins, and then you average those over a neighborhood to generate spins on an even larger scale and so on, most of the complicated things that get generated actually go away by, as you go to larger and larger scales. And there's, that means there's a technical sense in which they are irrelevant. And what that means is that as long as the microscopic model that you started with captures all the relevant interactions, that is to say the ones that have a chance of getting bigger or at least staying the same as you get to larger and larger scales, you'll be all right and you'll capture the macroscopic behavior of the material. Now, this uh, five minute sketch isn't a substitute for taking a whole course about the renormalization group, which you should all do. It's a beautiful subject. But I hope you get the idea that our ability to describe the macroscopic behavior of materials with simple models does not arise from microscopic simplicity, it arises from the simplification that occurs as we move out from the microscopic scale to the macroscopic scale. And that's not just dimensionality reduction, because um, you could imagine it's really the statement. So in fact, when you do this in a model, the way you do it 
is you imagine that the part of the system you're looking at is always part of a bigger system. So as you coarse grain and average over neighborhoods, you also imagine the system getting bigger so that the number of degrees of freedom actually stays the same. Okay. So in fact, there is no dimensionality reduction in the simplest case uh, in the theories. Um, and, and furthermore, it's really about the structure of the probability distribution. It's not about reducing the number of degrees of freedom. So let's ask, can we use this idea in thinking about neurons? And the problem, of course, is that we don't know what neighborhood means. Because every neuron can be connected to thousands of other neurons, and those connections can reach over relatively long distances. And so we don't know. At, and also, in the particular network we're looking at, we don't know which neurons are connected to which. So what we're going to do is to, is to use an intuition which says, the thing which plays the role of my neighbor is the neuron that is most strongly correlated with me. So if you did this calculation in on a real lattice, you would find that the spins that are next to each other are the ones that are most strongly correlated. So here, what we're going to do is we're going to do it the other way and say, look for the pair of neurons that's most strongly correlated. So let's look at those fluorescence, beautiful fluorescence signals that, that um, we saw at the beginning. So here are two neurons that are the two most strongly correlated. So let's average those together. These are the next two neurons that are most strongly correlated. Let's average those together and so on. And when we're done, we have, if we started with 1,000 neurons, now we have 500 uh, uh, giant neurons. And we can do that again, so we have 250 neurons, 250 coarse grain neurons, and so on. And when we do this, right, there's a question of how to do this averaging. Zero always has a meaning. So let's normalize things so that the average value of the non-zero signals are always equal to one. So that's how we average things together at every stage, and we do this hierarchically. So if, if we were doing this in a model, then we could go and look at all of those coefficients in the energy function and ask how they're changing as we go through these different steps of averaging. We don't have a model here. All we have are the data. So what do we do? We do the same thing that people do when they're looking at Monte Carlo simulations, which is you look at the probability distribution of the coarse grain variables themselves. So in this case, the coarse grain variable reflects the activity of the k neurons that we've averaged together. Remember, at the first step, you average together two neurons. At the second step, you average together a pair of two neurons, so that's four neurons, and so on. There's some probability that that whole group of k neurons will be completely silent. And if the neurons were independent of each other, that would fall off exponentially. So it's natural to look at the at the log of the probability, and you see that it, it varies with k in a very orderly way, but it's not the linear one. Instead, it's with some non-trivial exponent. Let me also emphasize that if you look at the probability distribution of the non-zero values, then what happens immediately is that as soon as you've averaged together a few stages, the probability distribution stops changing, and you converge on a fixed form of the probability distribution. So there's two things that are going on here which are very surprising from the usual point of view, but are exactly the kind of thing that you see in the application of the renormalization group to really interesting physics problems. The first thing is that when I average two neurons together, I get back the same distribution of activity that I had before. So this is just like the central limit theorem, right? I average things together, and the probability distribution converges. But remember that usually when you average things together, they're not very strongly correlated, and so the probability distribution becomes Gaussian. Here, you're averaging them together, and the probability distribution is becoming exponential with a little curvature to it, which is very surprising. So I have, I have variables taken out of two probability, out of a probability distribution. I average them together, I get back the same distribution, but it's not a Gaussian. So that must be because they were correlated in some subtle way. And that correlation is reproduced every time I do the averaging, whether I'm averaging together two neurons or 256 neurons. The next thing is that if you look at the probability of the whole thing, of the whole cluster of K neurons being silent, you see that it dies away as this kind of stretched exponential with, a, with this funny exponent. And the error bars that I've shown you here, first of all, you'll notice that this is a number that characterizes the behavior of the network that we can estimate with an accuracy from the data, which is in the second decimal place, right? And the amazing thing is you can do the same experiment 
in many, in several different animals. And the error bars across the animals are the same size. They're in the second decimal place. So this is just one example of the kind of thing that comes out of this renormalization group analysis. And it shows you that you can identify features of the behavior of the network, which are incredibly precise and incredibly reproducible quantitatively across multiple animals. So there are lots of things to worry about here. What does this have to do with play cells? How do you do? I mean, we, we all know that there are statistical problems because data sets are finite. Um, and we're looking at thousands of neurons simultaneously. So we're in a regime which is not the regime of classical statistics. And we're doing a very different kind of analysis. So you need to get control over this. You might worry that although these things sound interesting, maybe if I just write down some simple neural network model with generic values of the parameters, I'll see the same behaviors. That's not true, um, but you should worry about it. And we did. Um, all of these are concerns that, you know, if we had more time, we'd go through and they're discussed in the papers. Um, but what I want to leave you with are some conclusions. So from the first part of the talk, what I hope you see is that that simple models really do work. I can calculate um, properties of the network that um, that are uh, that are reproduced in the data uh, very quantitatively. And the other point is that when we go through this idea of coarse graining, which is the foundation of our understanding why simple models work in the physics context, we see simple orderly behaviors in real brains. These behaviors are quantitative, they're reproducible, and in the language of the renormalization group, they correspond to the really interesting thing, which is that, that the when you go through this uh, rescaling out to longer and longer length scales, there's some fixed model where the parameters aren't changing. And that's a non-trivial model because the probability distributions aren't Gaussian. And so this phenomenological structure is very evocative for people who have experience in, in these kinds of theories. And we're having the phenomenology, which we think is very robust. We're now trying to construct what is that underlying theory. But what I hope to have convinced you of is that bringing these ideas from statistical physics to bear not on models of the system, but on the real data is now a very exciting frontier. So thank you for your patience. And I think there's a little time left for questions. Ah, so one question is, is it possible to predict the next action of the mouse by looking at the neural activity? So in this particular problem, we haven't um, worked hard on the relationship uh, between neural activity and, and behavior. Um, in, other, in other cases, uh, people have. And so one, of, one direction um, is to ask, for instance, are the coarse grain variables the ones that, uh, that are most predictive of the behavior? And that, that's a whole, I mean, I, I've brought you up to the edge of what we know. There's lots of parallel things that people are doing and trying to connect this activity with behavior. They're also trying to do it, by the way, not only in a big complicated animal like a mouse, where necessarily you record from only a small fraction of the neurons, but also in small, um, uh, uh, in small animals like uh, the little worm C. elegans, which has only 302 neurons, and today, people are recording from up to 100 of those neurons simultaneously. So you can almost see what the entire brain is doing and then ask how that predicts what the animal is doing. And that's a very exciting problem. Um, uh, so, um, so someone asks uh, whether um, there's an approach to discovering new concepts with neural networks. And another is what are the failures of statistical modeling in neural networks? Um, so, I think that an example of the failures, right? A lot of the the assumptions that we make um, in building models are clearly wrong. And then the question is how those how those assumptions propagate through our predictions. And that's one of the reasons why we got interested in this normalization group approach. I think the idea that the network is described by um, by when you look at the network through the lens of the normalization group and you see the occurrence of this non-trivial fixed behavior, that is a sign that there's something which sort of has a deep meaning from a physics point of view that's telling us about the behavior of the network. And indeed, that is exactly the behavior that you see um, at a critical point 
um, in the statistical in the statistical physics models, which relates to the question about phase transitions. Um, and so the the it, the hint is that the network is somehow poised near a critical point in its phase diagram. And there's a there's another set of arguments that lead to that, um, including using the maximum entropy models that I talked about. But that's a that's that's a bigger idea. What I wanted to emphasize here was doing things that, and, and it's also not known whether that's actually correct, right? Um, so what I wanted to emphasize here was our ability to to put our hands on the data themselves um, and and just see what comes out. I hope that was a bit of an answer. There's also a question about references. Um, if you keep the slides, then you'll see references to our papers and you can work your way back. Um, I hope that helps. So uh, do we have time for more questions? There is uh, one question uh, from um, Ms. Merich Nejad. I turn ah, your mic yes. on. Please, can you, can you turn it on or shall I do it? Yes, I did actually. Uh, I tried. Uh, so anyone has a question? Yes, I have a question. Here you are. Hello. Hi. Please go ahead. We have your we have your voice. Uh, right now, can you hear me? Yes. 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 Uh, hello. Uh, I have a question. As you know, uh, in machine uh, learning. Uh, we have a VC dimension. So my question is how we, um, how you consider a VC dimension uh, of, in your model? Uh, the so, error, uh, I mean, how you consider the dimension, uh, the error, uh, error in your model in terms of VC dimension? Actually, this. I don't know. Am I clear? Yeah. Um... So the short answer is I haven't thought directly about that. Um, a slightly longer answer is that you're you're asking in a sense. So a little complicated, right? VC dimension is usually defined in a context where you're uh, classifying things. Uh, here we're making a model of a probability distribution, but there is of course a, a, a related notions of the complexity of the model. The naive uh, notion of model complexity would be just count the parameters. Um, and that's approximately right. Uh, several people have pointed out that, that then if you consider models that are in very different classes, um, so for instance, instead of, if you just think about the models, here they interact, the, the neurons interact in pairs, but you could imagine uh, a model in which they interacted as triplets or quadruplets or even more complicated combinations. And obviously if you consider all of the quadruplet, the four neuron interactions, that's a more complex model. But it might be that there is a model with a small number of four neuron interactions that has fewer parameters than the model we wrote down with, uh, with interactions by pairs. So there's a, there's a kind of active debate about how to measure the complexity of these models, um, which really is about how to compare models that are in different classes, um, uh, which is hard to do. Um, and that's a, that's a great question. Thank you. We have, we have another question. We have two other questions. Do we have time? Professor, do you have time? I, I'm fine. Uh, you're the one with the schedule. It's still uh, still morning for me, so. <laughs> so, um, Mr. Khosrozadeh, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can. Yeah, very well. Um, excuse me, I have a question about, I think, uh, your uh, slide number 12. Uh, I think uh, you predict some kind of the uh, last neurons behavior in the in your in the in the uh, networks. Yes. I'm asking uh, if we use some kind of another proportion of the neurons to predict uh, kind of uh, probabilistic the uh, the other part of the neurons uh, means okay. Uh, uh, your model can predict uh, this uh, a stochastic model may, maybe uh, predict uh, it clearly um, predict the last um, neurons behavior but if we just uh, 
use some kind of proportion of these neurons to predict the some uh, other neurons. Uh, if we, maybe this model uh, is uh, decrease the the accuracy. Um, actually, uh, in some in some kind of uh, certain proportion of the neurons, means maybe sixty or seventy percent of the neurons uh, is is good to predict the behavior of another part of the neurons. Uh, I'm asking um, that. Uh, do you think is uh, maybe the, the the question is a little bit uh, more <laughs> philosophical things? Do you think uh, can you see any uh, kind of uh, criticality uh, in in this uh, meaning of uh, in in uh, for example in the hippocamp uh, maybe we, uh, this proportion of the neurons can predict the uh, behavior of the network, but in the cortex, for example, this number is different because of uh, some. Uh, okay. I think, yeah. I yeah. see. I see. I see where you're going. <laughs> yeah. Um, so there's there's a couple of different there's there's several different questions here. Let me start with the most concrete one, which is suppose we do this, but instead, but in trying to predict the activity of one neuron, we don't look at all the other neurons; we only look at a fraction of them. So if you leave out a neuron that has a very small value of JIJ, then of course you have a small effect. But um, roughly speaking, if you choose a neuron at random and leave it out of the calculation, you do a little bit worse. And there doesn't seem to be, uh, so for example, if you're trying to predict the activity of a place cell, you have to include both place cells and not place cells. So there's, there's no obvious group, I mean, you can always, if you're, if you say I only want to do half as well, then maybe you can get away with using only half the neurons. But there's no obvious, uh, uh, there's no obvious grouping where you can say, oh, you only need these. Okay, so you can study how this decays as you leave out cells, um, but there's there's nothing. I don't think there's anything surprising there. But it's a good thing to check. Um, let me emphasize that what we're not doing is trying to get this right, right? We're not actually solving the problem of if I give you the state of n minus one neurons, what's the best way of predicting the state of the last neuron? What we're doing is taking the maximum entropy model that we built based on the pairwise correlations and asking, what does that model predict for those conditional probabilities? And remarkably, that turns out to be essentially correct. You also asked about, you know, could it be different in the cortex? You have to check. So I think part of part of the emphasis here is to let the data tell us. By the way, it is very similar in the retina, which is very different from the hippocampus, but also very different from the cortex. Um, so we have two examples. Uh, we don't know whether this is universal or not. Um, you also asked a question about criticality. Um, which also comes up in the chat. Um, if you take this model that we wrote down, actually, let's take this one, and you think about changing the temperature, and you ask, where, where is the critical point of this model? So temp what does temperature mean? It means to put a factor of 1 over t in front of all the things in the exponential, right? So scale the h's and the j's all up and down together by a factor of the temperature. What you find is that the critical point is essentially at temperature equals one. And if you look at, if you build models for different numbers of neurons, it gets closer and closer to temperature equals one as the number of neurons gets larger. So we think that this model is at, is at least very close to its critical point to the extent that we can see that in a population of only 100 neurons. The, from the point of view of uh, our modern understanding, the deepest characterization of a critical point is that it is at a fixed point of the normalization group transformation. And so that is what you are seeing here, that if you look at the probability distribution of a local quantity, like the activity of a neuron, and you start coarse graining by averaging in with neighbors, where neighbor here mean is defined through the correlation, then you see that the probability distribution keeps in a fixed non-Gaussian form. And so I think actually 
this path through the normalization group, there are many, there are many ideas about criticality in the brain, um, some of which we've had something to do with, but I think this is actually the one that gets closest to the heart of the matter, because this is not, this doesn't require you to believe in any analogies to physics, right? This is a statement about the structure of probability distributions and is entirely internal to the data and there's no fictitious temperature or anything else. So I hope, so I think that if we follow this path, we're going to get to a much deeper understanding of whether this notion of criticality is important. So uh, I think we have no time for the other answer and I uh, turned all the hands off actually. So thank you. It was a really pleasure, pleasure. for us. Thank you. And uh, we hope to see you in person in Tehran in future Shanasa seminars. Yes, I would love that. Let's, let, let's try uh, as soon as it's possible. Thank you so okay. much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so our next slide will be in uh, five minutes by uh, Dr. Nami and uh, at 6.45 p.m. See you.